Good morning. Good morning. All right. Here we are. We're uh, getting ready to go uh, with our Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship service today. We just had our Bible study done by Pastor Adrian Bird. I'm going to warn everybody, last week we had my dog Fitz uh, gave a shout out apparently to the other dogs, uh, and he's a barker. So any rate, uh, if he does bark, uh, it is raining. I don't know that we're going to throw him out, but we will uh, we'll deal with Fitz. So any rate, we are now on, and we're going to get started with prayer. Uh, as I mentioned last week, I have been reading through the Psalms, uh, beginning with the 91st Psalm on day 91 of uh, the year which was several Tuesdays ago. We are today in the 110th day of the year, and that's what I've been doing. Each day I've been looking at uh, the, the psalm that corresponds with the day of the year. Now, the 110th psalm, the 110th psalm uh, basically has special meaning for our congregation. When we planted Lord of the Harvest, Christian Fellowship out of the Fisherman's Net over 20 years ago, the Lord gave us five verses as prophetic encouragement, as just verses that characterized what we wanted to do and what we wanted to be at Lord of the Harvest. The 110th Psalm was one of those five. So that's a, um, that is uh, special for us today. So we're going to read this and I'm going to pray into it. The interesting thing is the Lord gave me uh, the 110th Psalm many years ago. I taught on it at the Fisherman's Net. And Paul Lukasevich, member of the Net, good brother, good friend in the Lord, uh, did a painting for me based on Psalm 110. Uh, and in it, uh, he pictures the second verse, the Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. The Lord will send forth the scepter of your strength into the midst of your enemies. Uh, rule, rule in the midst of your enemies was the translation. And it's a picture of uh, the spirit of the Lord handing me this scepter, this rod, this symbol of authority, uh, handing it to me. And I'm, I'm praying into it and I'm exercising that. So we're going to read the 110th Psalm. The Lord says to my Lord, and of course we know that David is saying that Yahweh is saying to his Lord, and Jesus made a big point out of that uh, in the New Testament when he quoted the 110th Psalm, when he was questioned uh, by the, uh, the religious leaders, if David is the father of Messiah, in other words, if the Messiah is David's son, how does David call him Lord? And of course, that's the 110th Psalm. David, who is the father of the Messiah, is calling his son the Messiah, the king, God's appointed, anointed king, his Lord. So the Lord says to my Lord, and it's, it's the same thing. It's the father speaks to the son. The son is our Lord. And what we are doing is we're hearing what God the Father says to our Lord Jesus. And what God the Father says is, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. So this day, Lord, we want to hear. We want to hear the Father say to you, and you in turn say to us, we are to sit at your right hand, the hand of favor, the hand of anointing, the hand of power, the hand of sonship as members of the body of Christ. And we want to hear you say, sit next to me until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. We have an invisible uh, enemy, a silent enemy, World War C, World War uh coronavirus, world war, COVID-19 that we find ourselves in. Lord God, make our enemy a footstool for our feet. 
The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Lord, give us, give us authority. And that authority comes out of our being in Zion, the place of your presence, the place of worship, oh God. Put us in that place and give us authority. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Lord, we're, we're not called just to barely get through this, Father. We're called to rule in the midst of our enemies. And Lord, give your church that authority, that authority of faith, oh God, that authority of being in your presence, that authority of trusting in you what God the Father has done through God the Son. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. My people will be a free will offering. My people will be volunteers in the day of your battle. This is a day of battle and we need volunteers, Lord, for your army. We need your church to rise up and be part of your army. A free will offering was an offering of thanksgiving for some mighty thing that you had done for us, Lord God. Uh, and Father, you've already done mighty things for us, Lord God. If nothing else happens to us, you have sent your son, you have worked the work of God in Christ. You have justified us by faith. You've given us mountain moving faith, Lord. Uh, in 33 AD, the entire world changed. Not in 2020, Lord. In 33 AD, the world changed, Lord. And so we will be willing. We'll offer that free will offering. And the free will offering is that we will dedicate us to the service in the midst of the battle, arrayed in holy majesty. Lord, we're, we're dressed not only as warriors, but we're dressed as priests, a priestly festal garments, Lord God. We are dressed for battle, but we're dressed for battle as those who lead in worship and praise, Father God. Arrayed in holy majesty from the womb of the dawn, you will receive the dew of your youth. And we pr pray particularly for our youth, Lord for that third generation, Lord God, in Christ, Lord, to rise up in this hour and be your warriors, Father, and be your warriors, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, uh, just as we go out every morning, the dew is on the grass, Lord, we're gonna go out every morning and your people are gonna be there ready in battle. The Lord has sworn, he's given an oath, he will never change his mind. When God gives an oath, he doesn't change. He doesn't go back on his oath. You are faithful to what you've promised. And this oath is that you've said to the Messiah, you've said to your son, you've said to David's Lord and our Lord, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, king of righteousness over Jerusalem, king of peace, king of shalom, Lord. You are our Messiah. You are our Lord that does not change. And your ministry right now is to make intercession for your saints forever. You said in Luke 22, Peter, Satan has desired to have you to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed the Father for you. I have prayed for you to the Father. The Lord said to my Lord, I pray to you that your faith will not fail you. When you are converted, strengthen the brethren. And Lord, we want to be converted, transformed, changed in the midst of this pandemic, Lord God. And, and let our faith not fail us. That's what we get from the king who is also a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath, he will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. Crush powers and principalities. Be at our right hand, Lord. Let your anger not be toward us, O oh God, toward your people, but let it be toward powers and principalities. He will drink from a brook beside the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. And David makes reference to 1 Samuel 17, when he tried on Saul's armor, it didn't fit. And he just went to the brook. And in the brook, as he went down, Lord God, to, to drink, to refresh himself, he saw five smooth stones in that brook. And those five smooth stones became the weapons of warfare that fit, Lord God, the weapons of warfare that defeated the Goliath before him. Lord, as we are refreshed in you, and today we're going to be refreshed in you, as we are refreshed in you, Lord, give us those five smooth stones. We don't need armor right now that doesn't fit. We don't need people laying things too heavy on us. We don't need people walking in denial. Oh, nothing's wrong. Uh, Lord, neither one of those 
too large, too small. We need the, the, the battlement, Lord God. We need the weaponry, Lord, that fits us, Lord. Grant it unto us this day. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Uh, Pastor Jan is going to do the communion service now. So, so everybody prepare uh, something for communion. We're going to have uh, um, uh, uh, Tostitos and, and juice this morning, the body and blood of Christ. Uh, but the Holy Spirit is the one that changes whatever our elements are into the body and blood of Christ. So get that ready. And when Jan is finished and with her exhortation and, and she prays, we'll all partake of the Lord's Supper. How come it's pausing there? Well, good morning. I'm going to try to look at the camera this week. Last week, I... Um, I was looking everywhere but at you, and I apologize. My eyes were darting from here to there. So um, a couple things I just want to say before I um, begin with uh, scriptures is that um, please take care of yourselves. Make sure that you're doing everything you can. Um, and the Lord has given us many, many um, ways to make sure we stay healthy uh reading the word is definitely something that you should be doing every day and, and and try to find those hopeful scriptures those ones that um take you beyond your circumstances and if you can play uh worship music and sing along i do miss our worship in our services maybe a miracle will happen and pastor and i will be able to sing a duet, but that would take a huge miracle, probably the biggest miracle of all. But also um, go for walks and go outside and get some sun when it's not raining and um, communicate. Um, call your friends and check in on them and they can check in on you. And you don't always have to call pastor. There's 120, 50, 150 people in our church that would love to hear from you. So make sure you take care of yourself. Um, I want to uh, turn to Ezekiel um, 47. And um, what's really been on my mind all week are about the stages we, we go through in Jesus, that um, the things that we um, sometimes don't progress to the next stage by choice or sometimes we rush a stage and we have to go back um, but I want to look at the stages how I view them in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 47 now we have a situation here where there is water flowing from the temple and um, it's measured out he brought me by uh, he brought me out by the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate and that face is east and there was water running out on the right side um and when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand he measured 1000 cubits and he brought me through the waters the water came up to my ankles. Now I want to stop there a minute. My good friends know that I don't like water other than showers or baths. I don't, and maybe a pool, but I really don't like lakes that much. And I would probably be the one just walking along the shoreline up to my ankles. Now when, when the scripture talks about the ankles, it's actually talking about the sole of the feet. And so when we first come to the Lord, it's our feet that enter first. Our feet enter the water first. And, um, and in that walking into the water, we see that, what's the significance of that? Well, in Psalm 119, verse 105, the word is a lamp to my feet a light to my path so as we get into that water 
we realize that we need the word. We absolutely need the word. If you're relying on Sunday service, these three hours to eat, to gain spiritual guidance, you will starve. <laughs> You need to read a little bit every day, if it's just a little bit. But the majority of us right now are, are home. And so, again, my favorite are reading all the Gospels. And so I've made it a purpose for me right now during this time to really read and look at what did Jesus do? How did he act in a situation? What did he do? And so I'm really focusing on that right now okay let's continue um again he measured 1000 and brought me through the waters the water came up to my knees now you know we sing this song so often and um and i never really thought about it until i read this over that the knees represent prayer you get on your knees to pray the knees symbolize something deeper than the ankles Yes, I read the word, but now I'm entering into another phase of where I am praying. Not just praying for me, but I'm praying for others. And in that session of prayer, it leads us to praise and worship. We know that when we praise and worship, we are joined with the heavenly host. That it's not just us, it's also them along with us and sometimes in church we've even experienced that we're like did i hear additional voices but it's powerful when we enter into that realm now um let's look at first thessalonians 5. i have so many um bookmarks here 5 16 to 18. And it says, I have it in the wrong place, Thessalonians. Just hold on for me here. I wanted to put the bookmarks in so it would be faster for everybody, but it looks like that's not going to happen anytime soon. So I'm going backwards to Thessalonians. Here we are, Thessalonians 5. Verse 16, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. I think that's really important too. This stream represents the Holy Spirit. As you step in and you begin to move with the Holy Spirit, there are things you have to do. One is reading the word. And as you saturate that word into your being, then the, you actually move out into the waters. You move out with the Holy Spirit. And you are rejoicing always. And you're praying without ceasing. And you're not quenching the spirit. You're a partnership. You're going out. And a lot of you want to hear God's voice. Well, you need to do these things to hear God's voice. God is not just going to um, send you a letter or an email. You have to take the steps necessary to hear from God. Okay, let's go back to Ezekiel again. Finding it in all my bookmarks here. Okay, here I am. And now we're going to, and again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river Oh, and that I could not cross. Wait, did I skip something? Yes. Again, he measured 1,000, and he brought me through. The water came up to my waist. So what does the waist represent? Well, the waist is about girding us with righteousness, about, okay, now we are, we, we, we are, we have the word. We are praying and praising, and now we're living righteously. We are not just going to do whatever. Um, we're not going to, and you fill in the blank what that means to you. I don't, I don't know. Um, 
what that means to you, but I know that some people are living a double life. They are living a double life. Um, and so in Ephesians 6.14 it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And I like the next verse, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So you can see it's threefold. Feet, knees, waist. So when some people are like, well, I don't really get why um, I'm not hearing God. I'm not really understanding why things aren't happening. You need to take this checklist out and ask yourself, am I doing these three things? You need these three things. You can't just be righteous and not know Jesus. You can't just be praying and not know Jesus. You can't just be reading the word and not know Jesus. We need all three of these things. Now, I want to conclude then with, um, at the end, he talks about, he comes to the river and he just, he just can't cross it. And of course, if that was me, I'd be fearful beyond belief. I can swim, but not very well. In fact, one time I was on a, a pontoon boat with the McClatchers, and um, they everybody was laughing because I was fearful the boat was going to sink. A pontoon boat, not a race boat. Not, I mean, that's how fearful I am of going into the middle of lakes. And the funny part was, and I'm sure they're they're laughing right now, but the funny part was the boat did um, conk out in the middle of the lake, and a storm was coming. So my fears were righteous that time. But anyway, when he gets back, he realizes that he can't cross it. It's too deep. It's and it's a, it's really an amazing place. What I think God is saying to us there is there will be times in our lives where we will come to places where it looks too deep, looks too wide, looks scary. He wants us to trust him. In those times he wants us to in Lamentations 3 verse 21 this I recall to my mind therefore I have hope through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not they are new every morning great is your faithfulness the Lord is my por portion says my soul Therefore, I hope in him. And finishing up in Matthew 7. I didn't have to mark Matthew because I know my Gospels. Probably that's the only, only books I know where they are in the whole Bible. And so I'm looking on Matthew 7. And probably everybody knows where I'm going to. Verse 24. Therefore, let me back up. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. You know, if we have the good foundation, if we read the scriptures and we pray and we uh, are righteous and really try to clean up our lives. That, that's a tough one for, for, you know, we sometimes think we've attained and, uh, and then boy, the Lord gets the giant, huge flashlight out and shows us rotten things in our heart. We're never finished. We're always constantly being checked. Um, and, and we should get to the place where we check our own hearts. But when we get to places like even now with the COVID, where we feel so overwhelmed, that there's really not a whole lot we can do to change that invisible enemy, we need to trust in God. We need to have faith that he will deliver in this hour. 
whatever that may mean. We don't really know what that always means. And that's, I think, another problem Christians have. They have a preconceived idea of how the story, how the narrative is supposed to be, how it's supposed to end. And we don't always know with God what his intentions are. We don't really know. Sometimes it would look like um, things are really, really bad. And they do look really, really bad right now. Let's be honest. But we just have to, we, not just, we need to trust in him. So speaking of life and death, speaking of the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us, um, always brings us back to the cross. You know, um, there was uh, Rick Warren, Pastor Saddleback, on TV the other day, and he was gabbing, gabbing, gabbing. He's quite a gabber. But one thing he did, and then I, I, I looked him up. I looked up some of his, his writings, and he always, no matter what, whatever he shares, brings people back to the salvation message. Always tells them how Jesus died for their sins and how Jesus rose again. And I thought that was so significant that we need to start putting that into our discussions. When we meet people we don't know, somehow get it in at the end. He didn't really seem to care if people liked it or not. He was on a TV show that wasn't a Christian show, and he, he just plowed ahead. So the crucifixion and the resurrection is an amazing story, and it's more than amazing to us. It saved us. Jesus saved us, and we talked about it last week. He did the essential things. So today we're looking at three essential things to grow in the Lord. That when you're saying, what's wrong with me, you need to ask yourself, am I reading the word? Am I on my knees? Am I walking in righteousness? You know, Jesus did those things. He knew the word. He knew the word. He was always he was always one with his father. He prayed all the time. And he was the most righteous on, on this earth ever. So as we partake, let us remember that we really want to be like Jesus. We really do. We we want to change our lives. We want to do these three things. Really. Even if it's just for a short time, you know, kids are off of school right now and different ages are expected to do schoolwork for a certain amount of time every day. For the grade I teach, fifth grade, they're expected to do 60 to 90 minutes a day. Now, that's not really very much in the scheme of things when you think about it. Can we do that for the Lord? Can we give him 60 minutes, 90 minutes? Can we even give him more? So as we partake now, as we take our bread, as we take our bread, thank you, sir. I have my little pastito. Um, I want us to think how painful this was for Jesus, but how much he rejoiced in doing it for us. And so some of us that may say, oh, I don't feel like reading the word. I don't feel like praying. I don't. I'm not going to give this sin up in my life. I like it too much. We need to think about Jesus. Read the Gospels. Look at what he did. Look at what he said. So let's now partake. And let's just be so in love with him and so appreciative. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, time for the next speaker. I wonder who that could be. And um, I just want to say um, that Bird, Pastor Bird's word was incredible. I just really appreciate um, our church so much. I am always amazed in how many people do read the word 
and um, our moving in the Holy Spirit and our praying and our walking in righteousness. So right now I'm going to turn it over, make an exchange here, and have a blessed day. Thank you, Jan. <clears throat> As you can see, we are a word church. Uh, we teach the word in our opening prayer. We pray into the word. We emphasize the word as we partake of the Lord's Supper. And now, of course, we're going to share the word. <clears throat> what I want to mention uh, in, in going into this word last week, I mentioned in the message about mountain moving faith. And that was my intention uh, to share on mountain moving faith today. <clears throat> And there are four passages in the Gospels where Jesus speaks of mountain-moving faith. Or in, in one of the four, he actually talks about a, a sycamore tree being uprooted and cast into the sea, and he talks about mountains and the others. But the references are Matthew 17, Matthew 21, Mark 11, and Luke 17. But in 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 looking into a message on mountain moving faith, I, I wanted to find some Old Testament references, first covenant references that were the basis of what Jesus was saying. And uh, there are two main ones. They're both in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah 4 and Zechariah 14. And in in studying uh, that I, I decided that we would do a whole message on the background. There's there's just so much there, uh, and it is uh, it's just really good stuff. It's important stuff. So we're gonna spend most of the rest of the morning in Zechariah chapter four. So so you want to head in that direction uh, right now, Father. We pray that your word would go forth in spirit, and it would go forth in truth, Lord. Father, we want to walk in mountain-moving faith. This is an hour where truly the word, be it done unto you according to your faith. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you well. Uh, apart from faith, it's impossible to please God. Uh, when, when we think of those particular verses that reference faith, we are in an hour where as the church, as the body of Christ, we need to exercise great faith, mountain moving faith. So assist us, Lord, as we look into your word this morning in the book of Zechariah. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Now, I'm, we're not going to read Zechariah 14. Uh, Zechariah 14, just a brief summary. You can look at it. it it's the closing of uh, of Zechariah's prophecies. Remember the background with Zechariah, he is a post-exilic prophet. What that means is the, the children of Israel were exiled in Babylon for 70 years. The, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had destroyed their city, destroyed their temple, destroyed their army, taken many people captive away to foreign lands in the Babylonian empire. And so, other than leaving the poor, uh, redistributing uh, other peoples from other lands that, that had been uh, captured by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, uh, Jerusalem and the temple lie in ruins. So that, that, that's, that's, that's where, where we are coming to. And Cyrus the king of the Persians uh, who conquered the Babylonian empire was raised up by God to bring the people of Israel back to the land. And so the, the first thing that's taking place in the land is this building project. And in the building project, um, they're, they're, they're going to be restoring the city and restoring the temple. 
in particular, Zechariah and his uh, uh, companion prophet, Haggai. Those books are back-to-back are -back, uh, at this particular point in the Old Testament. Haggai and Zechariah are a prophetic team that are raised up by God to encourage the people of God to rebuild the temple. Uh, at the end of Zechariah, Zechariah 14, it's talking about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord oftentimes was pictured as uh, the enemies of God gathering around God's people, seeking to destroy them, and the Lord coming and intervening. And what happens in Zechariah 14 is that the Lord comes down to fight against the nations that are gathered against Israel, uh, and he fights uh, in the day of the battle, Zechariah says. And on that day, the Lord, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives was a mountain adjacent to the Mount Zion. Mount Zion was where the temple was built. Adjacent to that is Mount Olives. Uh, the Mount of Olives is, is, is where Jesus ascended to heaven. Uh, so what the Lord does is he stands on this mountain and the mountain is moved, if you will. The mountain is separated. Uh, the mountain is broken in half. It's split in two and a valley is formed so that the people of God can escape through the valley. So this is mountain moving faith. The interesting thing is that it's this mountain moving faith is also centered in and around Jerusalem. All of Jesus' sayings, those four that I referenced earlier, take place in and around Jerusalem. So there's a precedent here about, about mountains being moved, and they have to do with the coming of the Lord uh, to God's people. Now, what we want to look at is uh, Zechariah chapter 4. That's the, the passage we're going to be in. And the first thing I want to point out to I want to go to a, a very popularly quoted uh, verse from Zechariah 4. And Zechariah 4 says this, Zechariah 4, verse 6. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty, Yahweh of armies, the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. What are you, almighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Very similar to Zechariah 14. This mountain is being moved. It's being flattened. Okay, It's being removed. And we'll understand when we reread the, the context of this verse in the entire uh, vision and prophecy. Um, what are you, almighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of grace, grace. Now, I just I want to start at this point with the significance of this concept of grace uh, at the center of this whole vision. This is actually the only place in the Old Testament. It's, it's the only place in the Old Testament where you have this term grace, grace. Grace, grace, uh, it's like grace multiplied. Saying grace twice, grace multiplied, a double portion of grace. And this, this grace, grace is being spoken to this whole process, which is the rebuilding of the temple. And we want to understand that behind everything that God is doing in moving mountains, is to rebuild the temple. We understand the temple refers to the people of God. This idea of rebuilding the temple, grace permeates everything, and it permeates it to a degree that it's the only time in the Old Testament scriptures where grace, grace is spoken of twice. Now, of course, there are other passages in the Old Testament that speak of a lot of grace or speak a lot about grace. Uh, a couple verse references you might want to take down. Isaiah 30 verses 18 and 19 uh, speak of, of this exponential grace, this, this, this duplication of grace, this multiplication of grace. Exodus in particular, when Moses is, is leading the, the, the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, uh, 
this passage that runs from Exodus 33, verse 12, in Exodus 34, verse 9, where, where Moses said, Lord, if you don't reveal your glory to us, then, then don't send us up from here. If you're not going to come with us in all of your glory, don't send us on this journey. And then the, the whole idea of God's glory is he says, show us now your favor. Show us now your grace. God's glory is his grace. Uh, God's grace, grace is this double portion that God gives to us to what? Increase our faith to accomplish the purposes of the Lord. And this is what we need, mountain moving faith. Another interesting thing, and this one you may look at if you choose to, in, in Zechariah 12, there's another uh, reference to this kind of uh, double grace. And it's in Zechariah 12, verse 10. Zechariah speaking to the people of God who are mourning, and it's interesting, they're mourning because they, in their, their sin, have pierced the Lord through. They've, they've thrust the Lord through with a sword, with a nail. They've pierced the Lord. They've pierced his heart. And, of course, that has messianic implications. We're going to see there are a lot of messianic implications in chapter 4 as well of Zechariah. But it says this, Zechariah 12, 10, and I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and of supplication. Now, what you have to understand is the Hebrew word for grace is hen. And then the the, the Hebrew word for supplication, which means to to it's an intercessory prayer. It's a spirit of intercessory prayer is tehenna which comes from Chen. So really what it's being said literally here, kind of a parallel to Zechariah 4, 6, is the Lord said, I'll pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and the ability to intercede for grace. A spirit of grace and a spirit that creates a spirit of intercession to pray for grace. So that's grace multiplied once again. And then, of course, it says, they will look on me, the one whom they've pierced. What grace does for us is it makes us look on Jesus. And when we look on Jesus, when we see Jesus, we have faith. Faith is imparted to us. Now, uh, we would be amiss if we didn't recognize this whole idea of multiplied grace is also in the Gospel of John chapter 1. If you wish to keep a finger in uh, Zechariah 4, we're going to go right back to it and spend uh, much of the rest of the morning on it. Uh, look with me in John chapter 1. And this is, of course, the incarnation. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us. It's interesting. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us means literally he pitched his tent in our midst. And the tent was the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was the forerunner of the temple. It's the place where God's presence, God's glory inhabited the lives of his people, the history of his people. So grace is all about building this temple so the Lord can come and inhabit it powerfully. Well, the, the passage I'm looking for in John chapter 1 verse 14 says, the word became flesh, pitched his tent among us, just, just quoted that. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. God's glory, which is resident in Jesus. Jesus is the tent of God. Jesus is the place where God's presence comes to dwell. His glory is full of what? Grace and truth. Now, Jan was talking about the truth. Prayer, reading the word, living righteously. But again, that is fueled by grace. Grace is the fuel for our lives. Grace is the fuel for transformation, and grace is the fuel for faith. John testifies concerning Jesus. He cries out, saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me. Historically, John the Baptist was, was born first. Jesus was born second. He who uh, comes after me, he said, was actually before me in terms of true authority. He takes precedence. 
from the fullness of his grace, we have all received grace upon grace, grace upon grace. See, the fullness, to receive the fullness of the Lord is to, to receive that double grace, that multiplied grace, grace piled upon grace, piled upon grace. And the, the picture here in John is one level of grace leads to another level of grace leads to another level of grace. So everything about God's glory, everything about God's purposes, everything about rebuilding the temple, everything about having mountain moving faith is rooted in grace. And that's what we want to talk about in Zechariah 4. But we're going to uh, finish uh, verses 17 and 18 in John 1. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law can tell us what we need to do, what we aren't doing, and can tell us the punishment for not doing that. But Jesus, because of his grace, can give us the power to carry out God's word, to walk in God's purposes. No one has ever seen God. But the one and only Son who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Jesus has made the Father known. Now, we're, we're, we're going to head over uh, to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 4. Now, the interesting thing here. Now, when I, when I um, get something from the Lord, I want to do some research, I head to my library and the first book I read uh, on this passage in Zechariah 4 was by uh, a, a sister by the name of Maureen Jung. Uh, and the book was called, I'm looking at it here, Faith in Jesus and Paul. And she, her thesis is she's comparing the mountain moving faith that Jesus encouraged his disciples to have with the saving faith that Paul encouraged his disciples to have. Now, the ultimate thesis of her book is they're not, they're not contradictory. Jesus' mountain-moving faith led to saving faith or proceeded from saving faith, and Paul's saving faith, were justified by faith, according to Paul, also led to moving powerfully and mightily in God. Uh, that was the first uh, uh, commentary I looked at for Zechariah chapter 4 because she mentions it uh, as a precedent for mountain moving faith. And then I, I go to my library and I'm saying, okay, can I find my, what, what's my best um, commentary on the book of Zechariah? And I came out by, uh, it's the New International Commentary on the Old Testament. That's called the N-I-C-O-T. Uh, it's the book of Zechariah by Mark Boda, B-O-D-A, and what a what a what a a very powerful um, commentary. But again, neither Jung nor Boda are going to be responsible for the way I apply it, though I will be uh, utilizing what Boda says. Now, I'm actually going to be reading his translation of Zechariah because, again, one of the things you have to remember about the Old Testament. The Old Testament translating it, it's different from translating the New Testament. Greek is a, is a, it was an ancient language, but it was a language spoken by many, many peoples. It was the language of the Roman Empire at the time of Christ. It was spoken in Palestine. It was spoken throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, and it, it was the the lingua franca. It was the, it was the, the language uh, of, of, education, the language of economics. It was like English, so to speak, today. So when you're, you're, you want to translate words in Greek, when you're making a translation from Greek to English, you have a lot of resources. You can find a lot of people who use that word and make comparisons between that and the New Testament writers. The Old Testament itself was translated into Greek. It was originally written in Hebrew. Uh, so you can go to the Old Testament and, and draw connections. But Hebrew is different. Hebrew was, a uh, first of all, is a language spoken by a small group of people, though there are relationships to some other uh, ancient Near Eastern languages uh, where we can do some comparative study. It's not uh, as, as clear cut as Greek. And particularly, if, if you really understood Hebrew, is a language, the way it was originally written, the scriptures were originally written, 
they're, they're consonants without vowels. I mean, there are no vowels in the language. They're just, they're just consonants strung together. Can you imagine if you were reading an English passage and all the vowels were taken out? Now, you could read a passage and try to understand what it meant, but the interesting thing is in Hebrew is you can have the same consonants with different vowels, and they're completely different words. So trying to figure out what the Hebrew says in a given passage is a little more challenging. Um, there's, there's a little more speculation and implications, uh, particularly when you find words that are not used often. So if, if, if you have a word that's not used often in biblical Greek, you can go to secular Greek and just say, oh, well, this word was used hundreds of times uh, in secular Greek, and this is what it meant, and it gives you a clue what it meant in biblical Greek. Hebrew if you're looking for what the word meant and you only have a reference or two in the Hebrew text, well, you're, 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 you're struggling. So, so Boda does some really yeoman's work in translating this passage. So we want to start out with, um, we're going to start out with uh, chapter 4, verse 1. I'm going to read 4, 1 through the first part of verse 6. Now, here's what you have to understand. In in the the beginning of Zechariah, there are a series of visions, one after another. Uh, the vision that takes place here uh, in chapter uh, chapter uh, four is the fifth vision that we see, the fifth consecutive vision. What's interesting about this vision is in the middle of the vision, and Zechariah is reporting this vision that he saw. In the middle of it, he inserts two prophecies and then picks up with the remainder of the vision that's it's a very unusual structure it's a highly unusual structure it's like you're talking about you you're telling the the church wow i had this dream the other night i had this vision and you're starting to describe the vision and in the middle of the vision you stop and you give two prophecies in a row and then you go back to the vision well you know it 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 could be a a, a little confusing we want to understand it but there's something important there is even the visions need to be interpreted prophetically. Now, we've got three main characters that have emerged, three key individuals that have emerged up to this point in uh, Zechariah. You have Joshua, the high priest. He, he emerges uh, and there's a prophecy about him. There's a vision about him uh, that takes place in the previous chapter, chapter three. Joshua is the high priest. Zerubbabel is the governor, and Zerubbabel is the the main um, the main focus on this uh, vision in uh, Zechariah four. And then you have the prophets Zechariah and Haggai. They were contemporaries. Uh, when you look at references uh, in the book of Ezra, it talks about Zechariah and Haggai prophesying together. Their books uh, go together. Uh, in the canon at this point of the Old Testament, and they both prophesy uh, on this, they have the same focus of their prophecy. It's this rebuilding of the temple. So you have to understand what those three individuals, the ministry they represent. The high priest, of course, represents the priesthood. The job of the priesthood is to teach God's people how to worship. And by worship, it means how to be in fellowship with God. They teach them the liturgy. They teach them holiness. They teach them obedience to the scripture. So the priesthood represents the teaching function within the body of Christ. The teaching function among God's people. The teaching function in God's church. The prophets, of course, represent the prophetic function in the church. Zerubbabel represents government in the church. Zerubbabel was actually a descendant of the last Davidic kingly family under uh, Nebuchadnezzar and was taken away to Babylon alive. He raised up children uh, in Babylon. And when Zerubbabel returns under the Persian king Cyrus to rebuild the temple. He has this, this governmental authority. Now, he's not a king because the only king in Persia is Cyrus, the, the king of the Persians. 
He's not a king, but he would have been the king. He represents this kingly function, which is the governmental function. And we need to understand the point in the book of Zechariah is that all three of these offices must work together. If the temple is to be built, if the body of Christ, which the temple represents, is to be built up, we must cooperate. There must be teaching. There must be prophetic input and there must be government. Government speaks of leadership. It speaks of authority. There is governmental authority in the church. There is teaching authority in the church, discipleship. There is prophetic authority. And the key is they've got to work together. There has to be unity. The underlying message here is the church needs unity among its members among its ministers to build up the body of Christ. May I posit a, uh, a hypothesis? I don't know that any of us can beat back or beat down or beat away this pandemic right now. The church in its sectarian divided state why well, I, I it's it's us four and no more it's i me and mine those who believe exactly what i do those who look like me those who have the same economic status those who have the same politics as i do well we're the real body of christ see that's sectarianism and that's a violation of john 17 uh, which is the commandment of the lord i pray lord that they may be one even as you father and i are one that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you've sent me. There is an authority that comes out of unity. And when we look at unity, we, we may add a fifth passage. When we look at mountain moving faith next week, we might put faith in there by itself in John 17. There is a faith that is generated among God's people when we are in unity that is hindered when we are in division. So we need to understand, we need teaching, we need the prophetic, we need the governmental authority for the church to work together. Okay, that's kind of where I'm going here. I'm, that's kind of where I'm letting you know. God's grace creates unity. You notice the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Uh, the, the, the Father uh, would, would be comparable to Zerubbabel. There's the governmental authority. The Father has governmental authority in the Godhead. The Son has that priestly teaching authority in the Godhead. He teaches us how to worship. He teaches us how to be in fellowship with God. He teaches us how to be in fellowship with each other. He teaches us to be disciples. He teaches us how to obey his commandments. If you love me, you keep my commandments. But let me teach you those commandments so you know how to put your love into practical effect. The Holy Spirit, of course, would be the prophetic. The Holy Spirit is the prophetic that releases the river of God, the oil of God, the lamp of God, the eyes of God, that we might see and discern those strategies to go along with the teaching and the governmental authority. So we have a Father, Son, and Spirit here. We have Joshua, we have Zerubbabel, and we have the, the, the team, the tag team of Zechariah and Haggai. Here's where we start. This is Mark Boda's translation. And there's a reason why I'm doing it, because he's being very careful to uh, make his translation based on a word-for-word -word study of the Hebrew. And I looked through a lot of translations <clears throat> to see which one I wanted to use and what goes best with what I want to share is Boda's translation. Remember, I'm not blaming Mark Boda for my conclusions or how I apply these things or not everything I say is going to be what Mark Boda says, but he has a very sound understanding of this passage. So here's the vision. Then the angel or the messenger who was speaking with me roused me again as one who was roused from his sleep. Zechariah is awakened from sleep and he has this vision. Then he said to me, what did you see? And I said, I looked and behold, there was a lampstand entirely of gold 
and it had a bowl on top of it and it had seven lamps on it and the lamps which were on top of it each had seven channels now he's going to go on the second item in this vision are the olive trees and of course he's going to ask the he's going to ask the the angelic messenger what are what 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 what's this lampstand? What does it mean? What are the olive trees? The only thing that is actually not interpreted, though it's in the background of the interpretation, it's significant, is the lampstand itself. Now, in the Hebrew, it actually says, "What did you see?" And I looked, and behold, there was a menorah entirely of gold. The lampstand is the menorah. You know, the menorah is the, it's the it's the the single branch. The single, uh, the single tree-like figure that has seven branches coming forth from it. It's it's one of the uh, items of the tabernacle uh, of uh, Moses and and the, the 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 temple of Solomon. The menorah is the lampstand, and again, because it has the the, the base of it is looks like a tree, and the arms of the candle look like branches the menorah is a tree symbolically it's a tree now it's a tree that burns with fire and light so it speaks of revelation it speaks of light it speaks of of clarity it speaks of testimony before the lord but keep in mind the menorah is a tree and the reason for it so much imagery in scripture the river that jan spoke about from ezekiel 47 the menorah the olive trees see so many uh symbolic pictures of israel and 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 the heaven is is reference to the garden of eden see see everything began in the garden that was our the ideal place that the lord wanted us to be in a garden and so you have this whenever you have trees and rivers you have this it's garden of eden imagery and remember the 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 earth is patterned after heaven everything that's true on earth just follows a pattern that's in heaven this is why biblical symbolism is so important we need to understand not only what the text says about the menorah but what it the, the menorah stands for so you've got this tree of life and it's shaped a little bit different it's it's shaped a little bit different from the original menorah that was in the tabernacle of moses it's a lampstand there's the the tree you have a this huge bowl and coming out of the bowl that's between the stand and the 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 candles or candle sticks you have this huge bowl and so the the branches proceed from the bowl and what's there in the bowl is this huge source of oil olive oil and then there are these pipes so to speak uh these these devices that are constantly transmitting the the oil from the olive trees that are to the right and the left of this lampstand uh, pouring them into the bowl and then the bowl is continually feeding the lamp with this oil so that the fire blazes continually there's this continuous burning now you know i when when you're thinking about this this there there are a lot of parallels between zechariah's menorah and of course the book of revelation uh the book of revelation uh speaks of the eyes of the lord jesus's eyes in the book of revelation when he is revealed are eyes like a flaming fire they're like the these these candles that these lamps that never go out because there is a constant supply of oil and what we're going to see see we've already seen it actually uh, at several points in zechariah if you actually go back to the previous chapter and you look at uh, uh, Zechariah uh, chapter three. In in Zechariah three, you have these seven eyes of the Lord that make their first appearance uh, in the vision to Joshua, uh, the high priest. It is um, um, Zechariah three eight. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your fellow priests who sit with you for they are men of symbol for behold i will bring forth my servant the branch now you're going to have 
the, your servant, the branch, who is Zerubbabel, who is a messianic figure. And in Isaiah 4, verse 2, there's this prophecy about the branch, the Lord's branch. The branch is, is the Messiah. Isaiah 11 talks about this sprout that's going to come from the root of Jesse. It's messianic. The branch is the Messiah. The priests are, are, are sitting here, and the priest, Joshua represents the high priesthood. The Lord's going to bring forth his messianic branch. And then immediately after that, in verse 9, it says, For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its engraving, says Jehovah of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. We'll go back to that. We're going to close with that because it's speaking of unity. It's speaking of the fact that when, when the Lord makes a reference to the priesthood, remember, they teach God's people how to worship. They keep them in fellowship with the Lord. And because they're in fellowship with the Lord, they're in fellowship with each other. That is a reference to the high priest's activity on the Day of Atonement. And it was on the Day of Atonement that the Lord removed the iniquity of the land, of the entire people of Israel once a year on Yom Kippur. But verse 10 says, in that day, says the Lord of hosts, you shall invite each man to his neighbor to sit under the vine and under the fig tree. There's unity. See, when God removes sin, the people of God are in unity. They're, they, they experience the blessing of God. The Being under the vine and the fig tree spoke of prosperity and blessing. But calling each other neighbors, the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. If you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not loving the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and strength. When the Lord removes sin, when he purges sin from God's people, from the land, there's unity, which means our lack of unity in the body of Christ is because of sin. It's, it's a big sin. I understand there are big sins that we are dealing with in the body of Christ. The biggest might be disunity. And that, that would offend people who think abortion is the biggest sin or racism is the biggest sin. They're all sins. They're, they're high places that need to be brought down. And they are sin and they need to be dealt with. But is it possible that there's a greater sin than those two? Is it possible if the church were in unity, we'd be able to deal with racism, abortion, sexual immorality, all the, all the, the sins we deal with? But notice in the midst of this, this priestly activity, there's a stone with seven eyes. Now, the lampstand is not explained. The menorah is not explained. It's almost like it's taken for granted that God's people know what the lampstand means. The fiery flames on the lamp make reference to the eyes of the Lord. And what the job of the prophet is, is to make sure the eyes of the Lord are functioning in the midst of the governmental function and the teaching function. We need the eyes of the Lord. Now, we're going to work on that. But here's another interesting thing, the lampstand. What is the king called in Israel? The king is called the lamp of the Lord. 2 Samuel 21, verse 17, just jot it down. They wouldn't let David go into battle anymore as he became older. 2 Samuel 21, 17, and they said, we can't let the lamp of the Lord go out. The king is the lamp of the Lord. Now we know that it is, is reference to, we know that's reference to the Davidic Messiah. And we know uh, that, that, that that's why Jesus' eyes are the flame of fire because he is the lamp of the Lord. And we need to see things through his eyes. And that's the role of the prophetic office in the body of Christ to make sure that lamp doesn't go out. And we're going to see what, what the prophets do to make sure that that lamp doesn't go out. But this is the, the we need to see that's the meaning of the lampstand because it's not interpreted. So we go to verse three, and two olive trees were beside it, one on the right of the bowl and another on its left. Then I responded and said to the 
angel or the messenger who was speaking with me saying, what were those, my Lord? Then the messenger who was speaking with me answered and said to me, do you not know what those words or what those were? Then I said, no, my Lord. Then he answered and said to me, saying, now he's about to, to tell uh, the, the, uh, the answer to this. He's, he's about to give the interpretation. And the next says, this is the word of the Lord concerning Zerubbabel, saying, now the angel isn't prophesying that. Zechariah is prophesying it. In the middle of the interpretation, Zechariah cannot hold off, and he prophesies. And, and this prophecy actually runs, there are two prophecies, two consecutive prophecies, and they run through verse 10. And when we get to verse 10, we actually come back to, then he answered and said to me, saying, and then the interrupted angelic interpreter goes back to his interpretation. Again, I think this is talking about the significance and the importance of prophecy. Remember at this particular time in history, Zechariah and Haggai are post-exilic prophets. The prophets don't have a good reputation returning back to Israel from the 70 years of exile. Because other than a few prophets, Jeremiah spoke the truth, Ezekiel spoke the truth, there were, uh, Isaiah spoke the truth, there were a few prophets at that time in history leading into the exile who spoke the truth. The majority of the prophets got it wrong. You know how they got it wrong? Well, <laughs> thus says the Lord, we're not going into exile. Nothing bad's going to happen to us. God's always taking care of us. Everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be good. Well, Jeremiah got up and said, no, everything's not going to be good. We have to go through what we're going through to get where God desires us to go. And the main issue is we need to repent. See, when the church, when God's people are not in a state of repentance, we have to go through what we have to go through. Now, there are all kinds of people saying all kinds of things right now, all kinds of prophecies. And all I'm telling you is, brethren, take heed of what you hear. Jesus said that. He said, be careful what you hear. And what you hear means be careful what you take down into your soul. Hearing uh, in, in Hebrew, in, in the Old Testament, and of course, in the New as well, doesn't mean just hearing something in my audible ear. It means hearkening to something, receiving something as truth, taking it down into the depth of your being and saying, this is the truth. And see, what you hear determines your faith. It determines how you think. It determines how you live. Be careful about taking things uh, in your uh, heart and soul that are not the word of the Lord. Those prophets were rebuked by the Lord because it said they prophesied a vision of their own heart and not from the mouth of the Lord. So it's hard to get away from our own hearts. We want certain outcomes. Jan was talking about that this morning. We want things to turn out a certain way, okay? If they do, praise God. But what if they don't? Well, if they don't, we have a sure word, and that's the word of God. Right now, I think prophets alike non-profits, we need to be studying the word, looking at the word, seeing what the word says, and prophesying out of that word rather than all these speculations. You know, if I hear a word from a quote-unquote prophet, I'll say, well, maybe, and I just kind of put it in my pocket. I put it on the shelf. But nonetheless, Zechariah and Haggai are now entering into an hour where People don't really want to hear too much what the prophets say. And so there is, there's an importance here in le the legitimate prophetic office, the legitimate prophetic word emerging. And let me make another comment about prophets. Is a prophet somebody, somebody who makes a lot of prophecies? The answer is no. Prophecy is a gift. Anybody can prophesy. And we can be right about our prophecy. We can be wrong about our prophecy. It can be half and half. That's why New Testament prophecy is said, let the one speak and let the others judge, 1 Corinthians 14. Most of what's being shared as a, pro a word of a prophet needs to make its round through the body of Christ, and we all need to talk about it. We all need to comment it. 
A prophet is just not somebody who prophesies. Well, there are people who I believe are called prophets and they, they prophesy a lot. I mean, you know, they like Mr. Todd, uh, our, our, our pastor uh, from Fisherman's Net used to say, my gosh, that person, he's prophesied more in a year than Isaiah prophesied in his whole ministry. And Isaiah has, you know, so it's, it's the longest book of, of scripture, 66 chapters. The point he was making is, if you prophesy enough, you're going to get something right. Here, here's a guy who says, look, at he's got 50 prophecies. This, 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 this man, this woman got 50 prophecies right. And you say, yeah, but he got 50 prophecies wrong, too. I mean, that's, that's still a, a, a 50% prophecy rate. No, the prophets do something else. And, and what, what Zechariah is going to show us is the primary the primary function of the prophet. So he breaks into this prophecy before the interpretation is even given. And we go now to verse six and we quote what we've quoted uh, previously. This is the word of the Lord concerning Zerubbabel saying, in other words, before I even get to, to, to this interpretation about the lampstand and the oil trees and, and the, the oil that's filling up this bowl and keeping the, the eyes of the Lord burning brightly on the tree of life, the, the menorah, he says, not by might nor by power, but rather by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a level place, and he will bring out the beginning stone to shouts, grace, grace. It has favor. It has favor. Now, that's the first prophecy, and we're going to stop there, and we're going to look at it. First of all, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Boda makes some comments on those Hebrew words, not by might. Might is, is um, it can be wealth. It can refer to wealth. Wealth gives us this, this, this might. It can refer to an army. So we can have economic might. We can have uh, uh, military might. It means excellent competency in life. You know, it's, it's Michael Jordan. It's, it's, uh, it's Bill Gates. Or, of course, Mommy, who is Michael Jordan? Okay, LeBron James. Okay, it's 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 Bill Gates. It's 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 Tom Brady. It's it's some some famous statesperson, some famous economists, just Albert Einstein, brilliant scientists. Okay, it's someone who just you look at them and their life is kind of set apart from the rest of us schmucks. They have extraordinary skills to accomplish things. An excellent uh, competency in life. And the Lord says, not by might. It's not going to be any of these extremely gifted people. Not by power. Now, power is normally associated in Scripture with the ability to create. And it is a word that's normally ascribed to God. And, and actually, if you remember the passage in Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8 says, the Lord says, I, I humbled my children. You know, I, that's, that's why I brought you through this wilderness. That's why I ransomed you from, from Egypt. And I did this to humble you, to see what was in your heart, whether you'd really obey me. And then the Lord says, and remember, when I bring you into the land and I bless you, I bless you with all this wealth and this abundance, this land flowing with milk and honey, the grapes are the, are, are, are the size of watermelon. He says, see to it that you don't say in your own heart, my own hand, my own power has gotten me this. But remember, the Lord is the one who blesses you. So not by might means no extraordinarily skilled individual. Not by power means even power that we receive from the Lord. You know, people receive blessing from the Lord and they start thinking, wow, I'm the man of faith and power. Pride. So it's, it's power that leads to pride. It's this ability to create, which makes us godlike, that can actually get us off the track. It was spoken of at 9-11, and I've heard it spoken of now under this pandemic. Why is America hit so hard? Why was America, America's defense 
defenses breached. Pride, brethren, we're the great America. There's nobody like us. Everything we do is good. Everything we do is right. Everything we do is awesome. We don't have to question anything we do. Well, hopefully right now we're understanding it's not by might, not by power. Whatever America has is because God blessed America. And if we don't acknowledge God behind that, it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And this Holy Spirit coming through this, 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 what we're going to see is the activity of the prophets assisting, collaborating in cooperation with the governmental and the teaching. It's not one being exalted over the other. Part of the problems of disunity in the body of Christ, we exalt one doctrine over another. You know, well, well, you know, uh, we're the Baptists and 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 we lead, lead we we lead more people to the Lord than anybody else. We're the Methodists, you know, and 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 we really understand holiness, you know, and and we're the Pentecostals and we speak in tongues and we're the Catholics. We 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 can we can trace our our history back to the 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 first or the second century. I mean, on and on and on. Whether it is exalting. Our individual gift, and and stop and think of it. When don't we need all of those things? We need church history. We need the Spirit moving in in the gifts. We we need evangelism. We need holiness. We need faith. We need all of those. Instead of exalting our our own doctrines or our own experiences, we can exalt ministries, pastors can be exalted over everybody else. Teachers, we got to teach the word. We got to teach it can be exalted over everybody else. Prophets, oh, what do the prophets say? Who care about the pastors, the teachers, the Bible? What are the prophets saying? And the point is, we're not talking about one or the other. It's, it's as ludicrous as saying, well, I've got the son. I don't need the father and the spirit. I've got the spirit. I don't need the father and the son. I got the father. I don't need the son and the spirit. It's like we're 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 dividing up uh, Solomon's baby into in 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 pieces and and no one profits, no pun intended. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit has said Yahweh of hosts, and it's talking about working together. My spirit will cause all three offices to work together. Who are you, O great mountain? Now we have to identify the mountain. To identify the mountain, we're going to go back to Mark Boda. Mark Boda, because this is this is a rebuilding. These are there are five phases of rebuilding. They're they're standing there, and in truth, what the mountain is is it's a pile of ruins. They are about to rebuild the new temple on the ruins, on on the same territory where the ruins of the first temple lay. And 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 so we 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 have this pile of 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 ruins that has sat there for over seventy years, where the temple was demolished, and it's this humongous job that's needed. And so when you say, "Who are you, O oh great mountain?" It's this it's this pile that has of debris that has to be removed. Now, when you talk about five phases of ancient rebuilding processes. First of all, there's the decision to build. The decision to build, in this case, we're doing a temple, a, a sacred shrine, a sacred place. You had to you had to have a word from the Lord to build. The king, who is 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 the chief uh, um, uh, architect and the 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 chief strategist in this rebuilding project, he's the he's the push, uh, uh, the shove behind this to rally the people has to hear from god we have to hear from god if we are building the church in this hour rebuilding we have to hear from god the second phase was preparation of the building site and the materials and in this case this debris this great mountain had to be removed the third phase is the laying of the foundation. There's going to be something interesting in the laying of the foundation. What was common in, in a rebuild is you took a stone, a brick, if you will, from the foundation of the first temple that was destroyed, and you placed it 
in the foundation of the new temple, and it was called the chief cornerstone. Behold, I lay in Zion. You, 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 you know the whole, the, the, the verse reference in, in, uh, in Isaiah 28. Let's, let's, let's look at it because, because that's what we're referring to here. Let's go to Isaiah 28. Keep your hand in Zechariah 4. We'll get back there. Isaiah 28. And Isaiah 28, um, where we really want to start is the 16th verse, a cornerstone in Zion. Isaiah prophesied, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The precious cornerstone was the stone taken from the foundation of the ruined temple and laid and placed in the foundation of the new temple. That was phase three, the laying of the foundation. Now, I want you to understand that speaks of continuity. God may do new things. He may, he may, he may build a new wineskin and pour out new wine, but there's always a continuity with what has come before. God can do new things, but he never does anything without a connection to the past. Behold, I lay in Zion, a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever has faith, okay, here's, here's our mountain moving faith. Whoever has faith in this rebuilding project will not act hastily. We hear the Lord. We clear the debris. We trust that whenever God deconstructs, he reconstructs. Whenever he tears down, he builds back up. That's what we talked about last week. There's continuity. We, we lay the foundation, the cornerstone, and it's connected to the old. Whoever believes will not act hastily. We take our time and are led by the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord, those who take their time, another verse later on in Isaiah, will renew their strength. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. Justice and righteousness are always part of this rebuilt foundation. And Zechariah will cover that in, in the book later on. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the hiding place. The first temple was destroyed because the first temple became something religious and not really a life relationship with the Lord. And the waters need to overflow and your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. Back to Zechariah 4. The fourth phase of rebuilding was the construction of the building. The fifth phase was dedication of the shrine. And actually we'll see that in the prophecies. And how's the Lord going to do this? Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And this idea by my spirit means not by power, which is normally what I create. God's going to do something new, brand new. That's a theme all throughout the second part of the book of Isaiah. When the Lord restores the people to the land, it's going to be a new thing, but it's in continuity with the old. Who are you, O great mountain? Now notice it says, who are you, not what are you? So there's a, there's a personal dimension to it. So not only would it be the ruins of the building, but if, if you read Ezra, you read Nehemiah, you read Zechariah and Haggai, there was a lot of opposition from the people surrounding the land that didn't want to see that temple get rebuilt. The great mountain is not only material debris, it's spiritual debris, it's, it's warfare. But what it is, is the mountain is gonna be moved. There's gonna be mountain moving faith. Before Zerubbabel, you will become a level place. You will become a plain and he will bring out, now Boda says, the beginning stone to shouts, grace, grace. Now, I went extensively through a lot of translations, most of it, talk about the capstone, the top stone, the foremost stone. And if that's the, the accurate translation of that particular stone, then you are talking about the final stone that goes in place that this prophecy would be about the, uh, would be about the completion. But the Hebrew word for the, the, this particular stone comes from the Hebrew word rosh. This is ha-ro-asah. 
and it's the beginning stone. It's not necessarily the capstone. It's the cornerstone. It's the stone that was referenced in Isaiah 28. It's the that first stone that's taken from the previous, previous ruined building's foundation and placed here. It's a beginning stone. It's the place where everything starts. Because Rosh in Hebrew, while it can mean foremost stone, most important stone, and, and a lot of people then uh, term it the headstone, the capstone. It also, Rosh means the source of things, the beginning of things. That's where it's the, it's the, it's the most important stone. So the foundation has to be laid right. That's the prophecy that he's given. And it's before Zerubbabel. We need God's government at work in the church, in the body of Christ, for the temple to be rebuilt. And then we cry grace, grace unto it. Now we go to, to the second prophecy uh, in, uh, in verses 8 through 10. Boda continues to translate, the word of the Lord came to me saying, again, the word of Yahweh, a second prophecy, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid this house, there's the foundation, his hands will complete it. There's the actual construction of the building. The one who lays the right foundation will complete the building. And it needs, we need governmental authority cooperating with the teaching of the word, teaching God's people holiness and how to, how to worship. And we need the prophetic oil to come forth. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid this house. His hands will complete it. Then you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. Now, I just want you to understand, that's an Old Testament prophetic um, piece of wisdom. Okay, It's a saying about the prophetic. You know how you know that the Lord has sent a prophet? Well, when the prophet's word comes to pass. That's why 50 out of 100, let's not call that person a prophet. We might call him somebody who walks in prophecy. We're not disqualifying that person from the body of Christ. He just, we just need to realize, like the rest of us, when we prophesy, we need help. I've, I've prophesied things that have come to pass, and I've prophesied things that, oops, I miss God. And one of the key issues is, is admitting when, when we get an oops, when, when we didn't speak for the Lord. One of the problems with so many of these these the prophets that, that they get in their word out there all the time, they're quick to tell you, and I spoke this, and I spoke this, and I spoke this, but you don't often hear about, well, I spoke these other things and they didn't come to pass, so I'm, I'm batting 50-50 or 40-60 or, you know, 65-35. Then you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you, for who has shown contempt for the insignificant day? now? You had a mountain that hindered the building of the temple, people opposing it in the spirit, great work moving and lifting and clearing. On this side, this prophecy, you have people who show contempt for what the Lord really is saying and what the, really, the Lord really wants to. And what is it the Lord really wants to? Build the house, build the temple. Christians. And I'm making an application. This isn't on Boda. This isn't on Jung. Christians who have contempt for the building of the temple, which is unity. Unity first in the body of Christ. People who show that contempt also hinder the house from being built. They will rejoice when they see, and here is Boda's translation of the next word, the second stone that's mentioned in the second prophecy, they will rejoice when they see the tin stone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now, I went through, again, many translations. The two stones that are, are referred to, one in the first prophecy in verse 6, uh, one in the second prophecy in this verse, most of your translations make them two different stones. In fact, some of them make, them, make it the second stone a plummet. In other words, a tool, an instrument of building, but it's actually, again, it's a stone in the Hebrew. 
Most make a difference between the two. Some act like it's that they NIV I think translate capstone both time and times, and that's incorrect. It's not the same stone. There's a second stone that you're going to see. So there's the cornerstone that goes in the foundation. The tin stone was the stone where something was inscribed after the temple had been completed. It was a dedication stone. And on that stone would be a plate of tin and would be written on it the dedication of the house. And we already know the dedication of the house. Grace, grace, grace grace unto it. I will pour out a spirit of grace and a spirit of intercession for grace, a spirit of praying for grace. So the two prophecies before any interpretation takes place of the, of the vision, the two prophecies speak of the foundation of the temple and the completion of the temple. So in the middle of this, in the middle of interpreting this, and we'll, we'll go to the, the final section now, uh, where the the angel interprets the the vision, what has to take place is the whole purpose of this vision is to encourage the people to build the temple, to walk in unity and complete the task. The temple is built, God's glory comes and inhabits it. We need God's glory in this hour to come and inhabit the church, the body of Christ, and it's going to be accomplished by unity, by the offices of government and, and teaching and prophecy working together. When leaders work together, the people work together. When leaders are divided, the people are divided. Be a leader and walk in unity. Now, when you go back to verse 5, and you got to jump from 5 to 10, here, the second half of verse 10, because that's the interpretation. The interpretation was interrupted by prophecy. Prophecy is central. We go back to verse 5. Then the angelic messenger who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what those were? The olive trees. All right. Then I said, No, my Lord. The, the lamps, the lamps uh, burning with fire on the lampstand. Do you not know what those were? Then I said, no, my Lord. Then he answered me saying, and we jump to verse 10 here, those seven, because it's, it's, it's seven lamps, it's seven <laughs> pipes. Uh, it, the, the word seven is there clearly. And there's, there's my dog telling me, uh, we better get the message finished. <laughs> we will. Those seven eyes were the eyes of Yahweh. They were roaming throughout all the earth, the eyes of the Lord. Can we look at a couple verses that deal with the eyes of the Lord? Because that's what the, that's what the seven lamps on the menorah burning with this continual oil are all about. First, I want you to look at 2 Chronicles 16.9, because these are the eyes of the Lord that roam throughout all the earth. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. Keep your hand or your marker in Zechariah, because we're going to finish up shortly. Zechariah 16, verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. The eyes of the Lord, the testimony that the prophets bear witness to and assist in bringing forth into the body of Christ, the eyes of the Lord. And the eyes of the Lord are showing himself as he moves throughout the earth, strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal and faithful to him. Brethren, our eyes, our hearts, our ears, our spirits, we need to be loyal to the Lord in this hour. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 1. Jeremiah 5, 1, it's a further description of what it means. Whose heart is loyal to the Lord? Well, Jeremiah, before the destruction of Jerusalem, trying to save Jerusalem from that destruction, trying to save Jerusalem from the coming pandemic, and that in this case is Nebuchadnezzar's army, 
Jeremiah 5, 1 says, run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know and seek in her open places. If you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes justice, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. That's what the eyes of the Lord is looking for. People seeking justice, righteousness, and truth in this hour. Amos. Amos chapter 8. Amos 8, verse 12. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. See, running to and fro throughout the earth, seeking the word of the Lord, but will not find it. Seeking people whose hearts are loyal. Seeking people walking in justice and righteousness. Seeking people who are seeking the word of the Lord. We have work to do, church. Repentance. Unity. Building the temple, revival. And finally, Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. That's what the eyes of the Lord are looking for. People crying out to God, crying out for the Lord, deliver us from our troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Back to Zechariah. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, the eyes of Yahweh. They were roaming throughout all the earth. Then I responded and said to him, so, so that's the interpretation the angel gives. Well, the lampstand, that's the eyes of the Lord. But, but he wants to find out about the olive trees. I said to this angelic messenger, Zechariah says, what were those two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left? Now, here, here's where we get into some interpretive difficulties. Obscure words, okay? Obscure words. Let me translate. You're going to be reading your translation, whatever you have. Let me translate Boda. Then I responded a second time to him. What were the two branches? Sometimes you got to ask God more than once. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. What were the two branches of the olive tree which are in the hands of the two oil pressers, the ones who empty golden oil from them? Now, when, when you see the word order in the Hebrew, most of your translations uh, uh, talk about this the pipes. It talks about what are those two olive branches which are beside the two pipes which empty the golden oil out of themselves. But in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew it reads, what are the two olive branches which are beside the two oil pressers pressing out the golden oil, who empty the golden oil from them? That has to do with the fact that the, the this particular Hebrew word, pipes, is not the correct interpretation of that Hebrew word. It's, it's, it was inserted because it seems to make sense in the context. But the pipes aren't the, the, the pipes themselves that transport the oil. It's the process that causes the oil to, or the olives to become oil. And it's these two pressers. So first of all, the branches are the part of the tree that contain the olives. What is interesting is that branches in Hebrew can also mean a flowing stream. So, so by, by interpretation or extension, it's that which is emptying out the gold oil. The branches have the olives on it, and those olives are being turned out into this precious golden oil. Beside the two gold pipe means the, the, the process by which the oil is being emptied from the trees. And the Hebrew word for pipe means oil pressers. They're the ones who empty the olives of oil by pressing them. 
The prophets are the oil pressers. They're the ones, this is the job of the prophetic office. It's to press the oil so there can be a continual supply of oil in the bowl that keeps the eyes of the Lord burning and blazing. It's interesting because this is not talking uh, necessarily about oil that the prophets use to anoint somebody. Because uh, there, there are two Hebrew words for oil in scripture. The word that's mainly used to anoint others, and prophets did anoint others. They anointed kings, they anointed priests, they anointed themselves as prophets. Uh, priests do some anointing, but prophets are the major vehicle for anointing others. This is not talking about an anointing on the prophets. It's talking about pressing out the oil. So not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The prophetic office is, and the Hebrew word is yitzhar, which is not the normal word used for anointing oil in the Hebrew. It's a word used for unmanufactured oil. You know, when the anointing oil is, is taken, it's manufactured and it, it, it follows a specific recipe to be used in anointing. This is unmanufactured oil. This is just pure oil being pressed out of the olive trees. So let's read verses 12, 13, and 14 with this in mind. Boda translates again, then I responded a second time and said to him, what were the two branches of the olive trees which are in the hands of two oil pressers, the ones who empty golden oil from them. Then he said to me saying, do you not know what those were? Then I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, those two were two sons of oil. They were sons of unmanufactured oil who stand beside the Lord of all the earth. They're not the ones who are anointed. They're not even, as many commentators say, well, it's Joshua and Zerubbabel who are going to be anointed. It's about the two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, who are pressing the oil out so the lamp can stay alight. It's oil for fuel, not oil for consecration. It's for the eyes of Yahweh roaming through the whole earth to find people whose hearts are loyal to them. This is the job of the prophetic office. The prophets in the Old Testament, their primary job was to make sure that Israel was living consistent with the Torah. They're the eyes of Yahweh roaming throughout the earth. Where are the obedient? Where are the broken? Where are those crying out to the Lord? Where are those who have a loyal heart for the Lord? And New Testament prophets, we don't, we're not submitted to the Torah anymore. We're submitted to the gospel. New Testament prophets are pressing out the oil so the eyes of the Lord can be on his church and, and the eyes of the Lord can continually be seeing and purifying and revealing what it takes for us to become pure, have a faithful heart, walking in justice and righteousness and truth. And the whole source of it is grace. When we speak grace into the body of Christ, God's grace reveals, God's grace empowers, God's grace gives us mountain moving faith so that the temple can be built. Keep that in mind. When we look at mountain moving faith, mountain moving faith is so the temple can be built and the pandemic can be broken and crushed by God's unified people. Now, the last thing I want to make reference to is. Then he said, these were the two sons of oil. They're sons of oil. They're produced by the oil they press out. The prophetic ministry is produced by the oil it presses out. Oh, God, let us get in there and press it out in our prayer, in our teaching, in our discipleship, in our relationships, in our exhortation. Let's press out fuel for the lamp of the Lord to be burning. Those were the two sons of manufacturer who stand beside the Lord of all the earth. That Hebrew word, who stand beside the Lord. What does it mean to stand beside the Lord? The prophets were called members of God's heavenly council. They were participant in God's 
heavenly council, which meant they were like the cabinet of, of, of the Lord. They were Yahweh's cabinet. They were the, the, the king's confidants. They were in the secret place of the Most High. The Lord God does nothing except he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets, Isaiah chapter 3. And this final reference is they stand beside the Lord of all the earth. They are participants in the heavenly council. And why are the prophets participants in the heavenly council? Because as they are pressing out the oil, they themselves become the eyes of the Lord in the earth. They're the ones who have the loyal heart, the faithful heart. They seek justice. They seek healing. They seek holiness. They seek to, to, to bring the eyes of the Lord as it as we read in Psalm 34, 15 through 18, to bring the eyes of the Lord to the place where God's people are prepared. In conclusion, we are working together the governmental dimension, the teaching dimension, the prophetic dimension. We're working together with brothers and sisters of different traditions. We're working together with brothers and sisters of different color and different people group. We're working together with brothers and sisters in the nations. In our in our, our anxiousness to find out about this pandemic, do you understand it's taking place in Uganda too? It's taking place in China too. It's taking place in Iran as well. It's taking place in, in England and Spain and Italy. We need to listen to what our brethren in those nations are saying too. And as we come together, as we come together in collaboration. So let me close. I said I wanted to close where we began, Zechariah 3. And I'm going to close with these verses. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your fellows who sit before you, you and your fellow priests who sit uh, together with you, you are symbolic men. You stand for something. You represent worship. You represent holiness. You represent the teaching of truth. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Zerubbabel's the branch. He's the governmental function. So, so you priests who teach, listen, listen to the to the, the 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 governmental leadership in the body of Christ. Collaborate with them. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua on one stone are seven eyes, and collaborate and cooperate with the prophets, the eyes of the Lord in the earth. Behold, I will engrave its engraving, says the Lord of hosts. And then you can do your job. He's saying collaborate with the governmental and the, the prophetic dimension. Collaborate with, uh, uh, you know, the, the lion shall dwell with the lamb, the child with the cobra, and Democrats and Republicans. We'll, we'll lie down together and work together because when we work together, then your job becomes easier. It was their job to, to offer the offering on the day of atonement that purged the land of sin. But it's only when you're working with the branch and the, the sevenfold spirit of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord and, and, and the prophets and, and, the, and the governmental. And I will help you do your job when you collaborate. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. No one of us has to do the whole job. We collaborate, we cooperate with each other. And when sin is removed, there's unity. And where there's unity, there's blessing. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, you shall invite each man to his neighbor to sit under the vine and the fig tree. I'm going to close with a prayer for the word. Jan is going to close us out with a uh, with a final prayer. I know we ran a little long today. I was long-winded. I had a lot to say. I, I hope uh, you were able to listen with those of you who couldn't last. It'll be posted on our, our, our Facebook page on church, and you can take your time and listen to it or listen to it again. But, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. We ask for unity in the church in this hour. It won't take place by might. It won't take place by power, but it will take place by the Spirit of the Lord. Send your spirit. We're moving from Passover to Pentecost. On Pentecost, there was a corporate outpouring of the Spirit. Lord, it's, it'd be great for each of us to get an outpouring of the Spirit in our, our time of seclusion. In our, our, our It's not our prayer closet. It's our prayer houses now. 
But Lord, we want a corporate outpouring on the body of Christ that we might build the temple, Father. May we learn how to collaborate as the Father, Son, and Spirit do. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Um, that's a lot to think about and um, a lot to take in. We looked at rivers and trees and olive trees and seven eyes and, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Father. So I'm just going to pray that <clears throat> the Lord, dear Lord, pray for revelation for all of us, dear God. Something was said today that sparked something in our hearts, that sparked something in our in our minds, sparked something in our spirit. I pray, Lord, that we would seek your face and if we need to go back to this teaching and listen to it again to see your amazing hand in everything, Lord. I just pray, dear God, that you bring us all revelation of who you are. As we walk in this hour of um, so many voices coming at us, I pray we only hear your voice, dear God, strongly, very strongly, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a great day. And uh, my husband is coming back to do announcements, so hang in there. Final thing is announcements. Um, I'm going through our church bulletin. Again, we will be meeting every Sunday uh, as long as we're under these current circumstances. 10 a.m. will be our Bible study. We're having various members of our church teaching it. It's been so good. We've had people from the first, second, and third generation in our church uh, teaching the Bible study, and we're going to continue to do that. Pastor Bird had a great word today. If you didn't catch it, it was on faith, and it's actually the prelude to the message that I spoke today and the message I will speak next week. Uh, next week, we will talk about that mountain moving faith, but keep in mind, Today, we're talking about the foundation of mountain moving faith. Uh, we will be meeting at 10 a.m. for our Bible study, 11 a.m. for our service. Uh, tithes and offerings, okay? Those of you who wish to donate to Lord of the Harvest, we have a PayPal account uh, that you can go to. Uh, you go to www.lhcf, L is in Lord, H is in Harvest, C is in Christian, F is in fellowship, LHCF Warren, one word, backslash support. Uh, uh, when you go to lhcfwarren.com initially and then hash a, a back um, slash support, you click on the donate button and it'll show you how to use PayPal or uh, and most of our members are doing this. You just send it to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship at our post office box address, P.O. Box 26505, 26505, Fraser, Michigan, 48026. Weekly meetings. We have a Kingdom Education Bible study. Pastor Bird uh, taught our Sunday morning Bible study every other Wednesday from 6.15 to 7.30 p.m. He is doing a Kingdom Education Bible study. Uh, it will be this coming Wednesday, April 22nd. What you need to do is you need to sign up with that class. You need to con uh, send an email or make a phone call to Lord of the Harvest, uh, LHCF number one uh, at comcast.net um, that is our our email address you need to get an invite because it's a zoom format this bible study you have to be invited and you'll be invited by email or text it's really easy to get on if you want to be part of the kingdom education uh, class that's wednesday april 22nd we also we have a weekly uh, prayer meeting. Uh, the weekly prayer meeting is Thursday night at 7 p.m. Again, you need to have an invite. So let us know if if you want to be involved in uh, in that. That'll be this Thursday night at 7. This Wednesday night at 6:15 will be the Bible study. Our food pantry is still open. Uh, food pantries are essential services. 
we are uh, passing out food on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. I believe we're going to be getting food on Monday and Mary Ryland will be contacting people uh, to come and help unload that food, what time to get there. Um, if you want to volunteer to unload the food on Monday, there, there aren't any clients. There are Tuesday and Wednesdays when the clients come and it's a drive-through. We give them their food in their cars. Um, you can call uh, Lord of the Harvest at 586-498-8869, 586-498-8869, and we'll get in contact with you about when you need to be up there to help unload the food. Um, finally, I think um, upcoming meetings and events, April 26th, uh, which um, April 26th is next Sunday. We have uh, the, the fourth Sunday of the month, we have an AWE corporate prayer gathering from 6 to 7.30. We're in the Zoom format for that. And we, we have a prayer agenda. We pray for things uh, and we have leaders pray and then we have other people's pr people pray. But that's on, in a Zoom format as well. And again, you need to be invited. So again, contact the church at that number email address and just let everybody know that you would like to be invited to that. National Day of Prayer is May 7th and um, what format the National Day of Prayer is going to take right now is to be determined. So we, but we, we, we know this, whether you're outdoors or you're at home on May 7th at 12 noon, let's all be praying and we know very clearly one of the main things we're going to be praying for for this nation. Father, I, I close with this. Father, we, um, we pray for our nation. We pray for the nations of the earth, oh God. Put an end to this plague, Lord. Put an end to the deaths, oh God. I know we've been praying for our brothers and sisters in New York City, uh, Pastor Wilson Chimeras. Uh, much of the church is has, is some, showing some kinds of symptoms or another. Um, fortunately, New York City is ground zero once again for, for a national tragedy. Um, and we were praying for a brother, Manuel Ramos, who is an elder there and who was stricken with the coronavirus. He was ill to begin with, and uh, Wilson texted me this morning that he's gone home to be with the Lord. So, Father, we want to pray that just break this, this plague in New York City. Break it in the nations of the earth. Uh, break it in our area, Lord. Be with us, Father, mightily. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.